while many roads may have led us to the summer of 2020 and those demonstrations, one of them runs through the athletic fields of the United States. After George Floyd is killed, you have demonstrations in all 50 states. That had never happened in the history of the United States. If we had been paying closer attention to what these young people went through after they took the knee all these years, we wouldn't have been nearly as surprised or I would argue unprepared. Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Vincent Intandi. I am a history professor. I teach African American and US history on the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus. And I'm also director of our Institute for Race, Justice and Civic Engagement at Montgomery College. Um, so today what we are going to do is talk with um, Tacoma Park's own Dave Zirin about his new book, The Kaepernick Effect, Taking a Knee and Changing the World. Dave is the, I mean, I could do an hour just on the introduction to Dave, right? So the sports uh, editor of The Nation, The Progressive, writes for MSNBC, writes for damn near every publication that you can think of. Uh, when you think of sports and politics, Dave is usually the first person that comes up, first person that a news network is calling. If you go to the African American History Museum, you're going to see Dave's face. If you're watching Kaepernick documentaries, you're going to see Dave's face. You're going to see Dave all over these types of issues because he's just that good. Uh, he also has his podcast. He also has his radio show with Ita Thomas. Um, and he actually taught at Montgomery College for a little while. He taught the history of sports class, which was very well received by students, uh, always filled, and students still talk to me about it to this day. And he is, again, one of our, our local own in Tacoma Park. Uh, I consider him a very dear friend of mine, and the world is just simply a better place with Dave in it. So I want to thank him for giving us the time uh, he's in Barcelona right now uh, in the evening, so I just want to thank him for giving us the time to talk to our students today and, uh, about this this amazing new book that I encourage everybody to get. So um, thank you, Dave. I mean, Vin, right back at you. Uh, the world is a better place because you're in it. I, I would say that about you, even if you hadn't said that about me first. But as far as everything else you said, I'm glad you're recording this because I think I might walk around with it like on a little tape recorder and just play it before I enter a room. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do that. So just get ready. All right. Um, all right. So we'll start with some, some easier ones here, just some basic ones uh, for those on the call that haven't read the book yet or anything of that nature. So when we say, when you say the Kaepernick effect, a question you've, you've obviously gotten a lot here, what do you define the Kaepernick effect as? Well, I think I can best explain it by telling you the story of how I came up with the book. Um, I was talking with Dr. John Carlos, the famous 1968 Olympian who raised his fist on the medal stand in the Mexico City Games. And John said to me that after he raised his fist at those Olympics and after another gentleman named Tommy Smith raised his fist at those Olympics, you started to see young people at track meets raise their fists. You started to see young athletes raise their fists. And that for me, immediately I had a kind of uh, light bulb moment where I thought about the stories that I had written and other people had written about young people who had taken a knee after Colin Kaepernick had taken a knee, that being the Kaepernick effect. And I was realizing that while I had written a lot of one-off stories about young people who'd done this and this kid who got kicked out of high school and this young woman who got forced out of her college, I, I realized that um, nothing was being written that looked at it, it's, in totality, like the Kaepernick effect, like how big was this Kaepernick effect? How, how deep did it run in this country? Was it just in blue states or was it also red states? Was it just in cities or was it also in rural areas? So I set about researching it and trying to figure out how many people, how many towns were actually affected by young athletes taking a knee during the anthem to protest racial inequity and police violence. And I found that I could think of almost any city, Google uh, player, knee, sports, high school, Montana, and something would come up. And it was remarkable to me how deep it ran, but you never see like a story on the news about you know the Kaepernick effect and this ha happening all over the country. I mean, partly because you know we're a country that's addicted to celebrity culture, so the focus is just on Kaepernick. And partly because I really feel like, Vin, the way we're too often taught history, this certainly isn't the way you, you teach history. I've, I've sat in on your class, but the way it's far too often taught is that it's a history of great people, usually great men, 
who stand on the levers of history and they make everything happen and the rest of us are spectators. And so we're just like watching these great people, usually great men, make history. I have a very different perspective on history and I know you do too, that you know history is made by masses of people and there are great people certainly who arise out of that, but they arise out of the mass. They don't rise independently of it. And I felt like the, we were going to forget the mass, all the people who did this, and it would just become a history about Colin Kaepernick. So that was going to be the book. The whole thing was just me like, I'm going to tell their stories. But then the summer of 2020 happens, the police murder of George Floyd happens, the largest demonstrations in the history of the United States happen. And so I went back and I called the dozens of people I'd interviewed and found out that they were all either in the streets or organizing to get into the streets. And that made me realize that while many roads may have led us to the summer of 2020 and those demonstrations, one of them runs through the athletic fields of the United States. And the fact that sports was basically, you could call it the canary in the coal mine or the weather vane for where this country was heading, like with, with tremendous speed towards 2020, I think that story needed to be told. And now that the book is out, like let's pretend I was publishing this or writing this book now, um, I would absolutely include in it these uh, so-called debates on so-called critical race theory that are roiling school board meetings and change the governor's race in Virginia. Um, I would absolutely be writing about that because I think what these young people did and the backlash that they faced is in so many ways also like a canary in the coal mine moment. Like if people, people who are shocked at the level of, I would call it grassroots racism in this country and grassroots backlash in this country, people who were shocked to see that in Loudoun County, Virginia, for example, if we had been paying closer attention to what these young people went through after they took the knee all these years, we wouldn't have been nearly as surprised or I would argue unprepared. So you mentioned George Floyd and you know the impact of that, but the one thread, there's many other, one of the threads that goes throughout this whole book is the uh, effect that Trayvon Martin's yes. had on athletes. Uh, I was teaching in Florida, in Sanford, Florida, when Trayvon was murdered, I was down there for a lot of those organizing protests and actions. And um, I knew the impact they had on our students. So I was, you know, I don't want to say please, but I was, you know, it meant something to see that that was the catalyst for so many of there. So if you could take a moment just to talk about when you interview these people and where the Trayvon Martin piece comes into this, um, that'd be great. It's so striking to me. Some people don't believe me when I say this, Vin, but, um, or Professor Intandi, as it were. Um, but people mention Trayvon Martin's name more than Colin Kaepernick's name. When I would ask them the question, what inspired you to be here? To the people I spoke with largely, Colin Kaepernick was more like a deliverer of a language of how to protest. Colin Kaepernick was a method. Colin Kaepernick was not some kind of Svengali or political leader or grand inspiration. He was somebody who showed people like, oh, you can take a knee during the anthem and your whole community will immediately know that you're against police brutality and against racial inequity. Wow, I can do that too. But when you ask people like what in their soul, like in the marrow of their bones, why they did what they did, it was Trayvon Martin's name time and again. And I started hearing Trayvon Martin's name so much, I started to make that part of my interview process um, and asking people, what, what was it about that? There have been so many horrific cases, particularly ones that have come to light over the last uh, decade. What is it about that case? Um, particularly since Trayvon Martin's death was not at the hands of police, it was at the hands of a wannabe cop named George Zimmerman who stalked and killed him. And what it came down to is, first of all, the time when it happened, 2012. A lot of the folks I spoke to were 11, 12, 13 years old when that happened. So, you know, that was the first time they really realized that the world was unjust and that they just, it stained them, it scarred them to see Trayvon killed. And then the big part of it was it's not even so much the killing, it's the fact that there was no justice afterwards. And that it took mass, as you well know, massive demonstrations just to get Zimmerman arrested. 
Like there, it took walkouts, demonstrations. It took something that really, you know, swallowed up Florida for a while in terms of the, the media just to get an arrest. And what, what I kept thinking about is people were talking about Trayvon Martin to me and, and how it, how they carried his name with them through their own years of discovery and protest was it reminded me so much of hearing civil rights activists speak about the effect it had on them when Emmett Till was killed. And it, the parallels are really eerie. I mean, Emmett Till and Trayvon Martin, both 14 years old, Emmett Till and, and Trayvon Martin, both not killed by police, but by people who might as well have been police, because in both cases also found innocent in a very unjust and unfair court of law. So the similarities there very, very strongly. And I feel like we have this new generation of activists and for them, Trayvon Martin truly is their Emmett Till. One thing that I, I loved about the book is I would sit there reading it and say, well, I hope he's going to, you know, I wonder if he's going to get to a rural area instead of just a, a, a bigger city. And I would turn the page and boom, there's a story about a rural area. Or I would say, I hope he's going to get to a more private elite school that is mostly white students. Boom. Then I would see that there, right? So can you talk about the difference that you came across in some of those interviews with those elite, more private schools or versus rural schools? I was taken with Alexis. I know it's two different Alexis. The first one, she was in cheer and her presentation on Alton Sterling, her presentation on Angola's prison, like that really got me because it showed that it wasn't just, there was an effect there, no pun intended, afterwards. So if you could just talk a moment about the difference in some of the schools and people you interviewed. Yeah, I mean, what, what I found more than anything else is, let me just be clear that I tried to make the book representative of what, I, what my research was telling me nationally. So, and I'm not saying I did that with 100% accuracy, but like I piled up on my computer, I have a file with, with hundreds of examples of people doing this. And I knew I couldn't have a book with hundreds of examples and give do it justice or it would all blend together too much. So. I really tried to make it representative in terms of how many uh, predominantly white institutions are going to be in this book. How many times am I going to be talking to high schoolers versus college students versus pros? Like how many women are going to be represented in the book? How many cheerleaders are going to be represented in the book? Um, I wanted all of that represented. Um, a couple of examples of white people who either took a knee or raised a fist to speak about that question of of what it means to, to do such an action like that uh, as a white person. I, I wanted to interrogate all of it. Um, and, and so I could draw out some broader conclusions. And one of the things that's certainly true is the students who are at predominantly white institutions, what they often dealt with are what, you know, a phrase we're very familiar with now, which is this question of microaggressions and this idea of having subtle racist jabs thrown at them just every day and it becoming kind of unbearable. And for a lot of these people, that was a problem anyway, but the straw that really broke the camel's back is when you did have these high profile killings of people like Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, you know, killings that were caught on video or, or Sandra Bland and, and the way that case resonated. And they would go to school just bereft and traumatized by what they were seeing and to have the reaction by friends of theirs, even totally like, what, what are you upset about? Like that in and of itself, like pushed a lot of people to take a knee, like this idea that they wanted to wake the school up. One person I spoke with, she, she put it this way, and I've heard other people say this, but I, I just, it struck me because she said it to me over the phone with a, with a, choke in her voice as she said, people told me I made, made them uncomfortable for the one minute during the anthem where I took a knee. I just want you to feel for one minute how I feel every day at this school. And really trying to impose how they're feeling. Now at, at schools that were not prominently white institutions, I mean, on the one hand, there, there's a great story of, of, a, of Sid, Sydney Stallworth in the book, cheerleader from Howard and she, had a very positive experience in terms of how people in the school and the community in DC rallied around her. Like she went into a coffee shop and you know, there was a picture of her up on the billboard and whatnot. And she did a triple take. 
Um, things like that are great stories. But honestly, whether we're talking about rural, urban, predominantly white institution, historically black college, whatever we're talking about, what it often comes down to is, does the coach have your back? Do your teammates have your back? Uh, does the administration have your back? And what you found more often than not in these stories, because it's true, is that they don't have the students back. One young person said to me, and I think this statement just has so is so sad, is she said to me, people always call my generation apathetic, but if there's one, what I'm, one thing I'm learning after taking a knee is that the one thing worse than apathy is actually trying to do something. And that feeling of being young and basically what older people are telling you is that nothing you do is right. You're too apathetic. Oh, now what you're, oh, you're protesting now? Well, you're ruining the team. Keep politics out of sports, you know, just constantly throwing garbage at people instead of trying to take what they're saying seriously and actually have a conversation. There are a couple cases in the book where the young people do get that level of engagement from adults. And every time that happens, when there's real engagement, it's a good story. But more often than not, it's it's kick you off the team. It's death threats. It's all kinds of behavior that I would call antisocial, which tragically have become, I would argue, a, a dominant strain of politics in the Republican Party. Like, how much of a jerk can I be and how threatening can I be as a political mode of operation, not how can I defeat you in a debate or how can we come to agree to disagree or how can we find common ground? It seems like that is off the table. And I'll say for the umpteenth time already, Vin, that I think if we'd been collectively more attentive to these individual stories in these small towns, we wouldn't be so taken aback by the crazy backlash that's been taking place over the last year. Yeah, to the idea of support, I found myself repeatedly circling that it was oftentimes teachers that were the ones that were the most supportive, not coaches, yes. not administrators, teachers that always kind of had the students' backs. Um, were there people you interviewed that either were scared to go on record because of where they live or their school, so they, you, you had, they couldn't maybe be in the book? Were there people that you interviewed that when they get Googled about this, maybe they had either they were fearful of or it did hurt their careers or job prospects or anything like that now that they're older? Did you find any kind of that kind of backlash in this? Once. <laughs> and I think that's interesting because before doing the book, I would have thought that might be something I'd hear quite a bit. But only one person did a full interview with me and then came back and said, I don't want you to use my name. And then came back a second time and said, I don't want to be in the book. There was also a young man who said, I want to use a fake name and then came back after the fact and said, I want to use my real name. And that to me is also worth a little bit of conversation because what, what I found was that even people who went through hell and back by doing this, by doing something as simple as taking a knee during the anthem at their game, uh, they had no regrets. And they were really proud of what they did. The whole reason why they wanted to talk to me in the first place was because they were proud of what, of what they did. I mean, I went about trying to find people for this book in a couple of different ways, like one by tracking people down over the internet and then getting in touch with them. And the other, and this proved incredibly fruitful, you know, I put out a, a call on social media, like, yo, do you know anybody who's done this? DMs are open and I just got like flooded with stories. And, and so like, these are people who are like, yes, I'm and th keep in mind, this is at the beginning of the pandemic months before the police killing of George Floyd. And so I was so taken aback by how many people were sort of locked up in their homes, frustrated with the world, but really proud of this thing they had done a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, and they wanted to talk about it. Like they wanted to have those kinds of conversations. Now, I don't know about um, the folks on this call or whatever, but you know, I've got a 17 year old daughter and talking to her on the phone is not something that happens easily. And more often than not, if I call her, she's gonna say, what's the emergency? And I'd say, no emergency, I'm just calling. She goes, oh, text for that. You know, cause calling is like, you better be trapped under a piece of furniture. And these young people though, they, they, they were home, they were bored. They were antsy. In a lot of ways, I could have seen a precursor of the demonstrations in 2020 just on our conversations because 
they, they, they were they were antsy to do something and to speak about what they did and that afforded me a tremendous opening as an as an, an interviewer and as a writer because you know you're only as yeah. good as your subjects and they really wanted to talk i also you know we, you talked about microaggressions but it's very clear in the book that there's just outright aggression right the yeah macro <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, they're, they're launched at a number of these individuals and, um, you know, really nasty things that happen as a result. And I, again, thought of this book when I saw the, the recent video at the hockey game in Pennsylvania, where these guys in the crowd are just chanting the most horrific things, you know, possible at this, this woman who's a, this young woman who's the goaltender. And it just made me think with the people you interviewed all different parts of the country, then you see things like that. Plus you had the macroaggressions that you just talked about. Do you think the generation, you got a 17 year old are, where do you think they are at in this headspace? Of course, nothing's monolithic. I, you don't know every single person, but do you think there's oh. this attitude of justice is, is more prevalent or do you think who you interviewed are the anomaly here? What was your experience? I'll tell you, I started this book feeling pessimistic and I ended it feeling optimistic. Um, I feel like this young generation of people, they are, first of all, of course, more demographically diverse, but also less tolerant of intolerance than any generation in the history of the United States. And they're tough. That's the part that, I, that really gets to me is that they're tough. They're, you know, the, this myth of the, of the snowflake or you know, of the person who needs the safe space. Well, who really needs safe spaces in this world? It sounds like those parents in Loudoun County want safe spaces so their white kids don't have to learn about racism. You know, they're the ones asking for a safe space. The young people whom I spoke with, they're, they're ready for that. You know, they are tough. They are people who uh, want to take on the world and change it. And I think they, um, from a broad perspective, are gonna shake up this country like, like nobody's business. Um, because they're just not going to settle for what other generations have settled for. I see this in my sister and her friends, definitely. And I know that's a small sample size, but just talking to these young people for the book. I mean, I talk to dozens and dozens and dozens of young folks and they, they all come out of this experience, even when it was done, when, when, it, when it was so hard on them, they came out of this experience just tough. I mean, those parents in Loudoun County are worried about having to debate racism in the classroom. The young people I talk to, they want classes where people debate racism. Like that's what they want. These are the questions that define their lives and they want to be talking about them in the classroom and they want to be putting those ideas in practice into the streets. Yeah, I mean, the, the toughness that you mentioned, what stuck out to me is there were those that were influenced or motivated by Trayvon, if we're looking for an aha moment, yes. But I also saw in a lot of these people you interviewed, not an aha moment, but a cumulative effect, right? Especially with, um, it was, I think, Alexis with the U.S. at the end. Yes. Um, and that it wasn't one thing, that it was just this cumulative effect of either things that were going on nationally or things going on in their own lives. These own lives. Consistently, it was like they're finally trying to find something to do, and this is it, right? So that was showed me yeah that there were there there was for for many of them like uh, this just breaking moment where i got to do something now and this is how it manifests and this is one of the remarkable things about social media because that that's and i know social media giveth and social media taketh away i know it can be a sewer i know it's oftentimes social media is the is the white hood of the 21st century you know where people can be racist as they want without fear of reprisal but what social media also did was these, it took the experiences of these young people, which sometimes involved getting stopped by police and pulled over because they were in the wrong car in the wrong neighborhood. Sometimes it might've been involved having a family member uh, beaten by police. Sometimes it might involve someone in their church like Alexis who was killed by the police. You know, they all have these set of experiences, but when they start seeing on social media that people are also having these experiences in other places, when they start seeing the beginnings in Ferguson of the Black Lives Matter movement, they all immediately start to feel less alone. But then there's that problem, which is, all right, I feel less alone, 
but I don't live in Ferguson, Missouri. I don't live in New York City where I can roll out to Union Square and there'll be a thousand people there ready to march up to 42nd Street. What do I do if I live in Brunswick, Ohio? You know, I'm, I'm now seeing other people have been through it too. I'm not alone. What do we do? Colin Kaepernick comes along, very similar headspace. You know, it's August of 2016. He's very upset about the murders of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile. He's very upset about racism in the world. And so he just does something. And people see what he does and they say, oh, wait a minute. I play football. I play softball. I play soccer. I play ultimate Frisbee. I'm a cheerleader. I can do that too. And as soon as I do it, I'm part of a movement. And honestly, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was, in a lot of ways, the idea of this book comes from them themselves, from the young people who saw themselves as part of this movement. We could call it a subconscious movement. We could call it an unconscious movement, but it was on a national basis, a movement. And I wanted to write the book to sort of like almost say to them, to speak back to them and saying like, yes, not only were you right to do what you did, you were actually part of something socially that's so significant, we haven't even reckoned with, with its after effects and what it's gonna mean. Cause I'll tell you this, sports is forever changed. And it, and it wouldn't be forever changed if it was just this one San Francisco 49ers quarterback taking a knee. That's not enough to change sports forever. What is enough to change sports forever is when that action gets replicated throughout the sports world and not just in the United States either. Did, um, did anybody talk about this having an effect on their family? Did they lose mm -hmm. family members that split with their parents? Like, how did that play out, you know, with family dynamics? I mean, very, God, that, it's interesting. Like, there's so many common threads between these stories. And unfortunately, one of the common threads is coaches who do not have the backs of their kids, even though there are some cases where coaches did have their backs. The predominant through line is that coaches did not have their backs because um, they were more worried about themselves. With parents, it's super individualized. Like I, this one, um, Arielli, who I spoke with, uh, her parents, uh, immigrants from, uh, I believe, Mexico, um, living in California, and they wanted her to not do this. I mean, very much like, you know, you're going to draw attention to the family. We don't want that. We're keeping our heads down. We're working you know, real kind of like model minority American dream stuff. Like, like we don't do that. You know, the last thing we want is attention, but her feeling like, no, I, I, I'm kind of no choice. I'm going to do this. But then, then you have cases like Joshua Meyer, the uh, basketball coach in Vermont, where um, his, his wife is like running down to the bench to keep people from assaulting the players. You know, that's a different kind of support from family. <laughs> and um, it, it really varied. Like some parents and family members uh, took a knee um, in the stands to show support. Some stood up and did um, standing ovation for the players and clapped through the anthem, and, which was a kind of an interesting thing to do. And some really wanted their kids to stop doing it. The other way it affected the family is that in a couple of cases, you know, we're also um, public now on the internet where family members were threatened, had their lives threatened. Little brothers and sisters had their lives threatened. And that was the one, it's so interesting, that, that was the one thing that some people, no one regretted doing what they did. But some people regretted this idea that they were they brought their families into it. They brought their their little brother or sister into it like that upset them. And it reminded me of a conversation I had with Dr. John Carlos, um, 68 Olympian, who always talks about how like one of his lines in his speech is he likes to say, like, the only regret I have is that more people didn't do it with me, you know, and but he also says to me more on the private side, you know, like the other regret that I have is that my actions came, fell on my family's shoulders and I never wanted that. And it never really occurred to me that it would be something they'd have to answer for also. The 
prong section of the book is shorter than the high school yeah. and college section. And I didn't know if that On was purpose. because it's already been focused right, I figured. So was there a glaring difference that you saw athletes from college to high school or college to pro? Were there, how did that, or was it, was that not a factor in their decisions or? Well, it's, it's interesting, Vin, because they, um, there were all sorts of debates with my editor about how the book should actually, like I had all these interviews. I knew the content was amazing. And it was like, how do we divide up this book? Do we do it by sport? Do we do it by, uh, male athletes, female athletes? Do we do it um, by all sorts of things came up in terms of how to do it? Like, do we try to group what happened to them or good experiences, bad experiences? And I just was like, you know what? At the high school level, you've got your own challenges. At the college level, you're dealing with scholarships. You've got your own challenges. And at the pro level, you know, the reality of being a pro athlete in this country, you know, people act like you won the genetic lottery and, you know, you've, you've got this dream life, but you know, the reality Vin, cause I'm sh I know you talk about it and I talk about it when I teach the sports stuff is like, you know, the average career is going to run anywhere from three to six or seven years, depending on the sport. Um, sports like the NFL don't have guaranteed contracts takes a hell of a toll on your body. And you usually find yourself at age 27, not knowing what the heck to do with your life. So that's not the easiest road for someone to go on. And, but if, if you're gonna be done by 27, that means you have basically five years to earn enough money, often to not only support your family, but also support friends, support community, like a tremendous financial burden gets, can get placed on these athletes to do that. So if you're talking about taking a knee in that context, you're talking about risking the entire, the lottery ticket, basically risking the whole setup. Uh, and so that needed to be discussed that needed to be talked through about what it means to be a pro and do this. And then the book comes out, Eric Reed and Kenny Stills, two of the people I interviewed outside the NFL looking in. Kenny Stills is on a team now, but it took a while to get him on the team. And I just thought that, you know, sort of makes the argument for the book and also speaks to how difficult it can be to do it as a pro. Now, the one thing also in the pro section is I got to interview Megan Rapino, who's generally seen as the first white athlete uh to take a knee and it's just interesting to me like if we ever want to talk about the reality of racism in the united states and how it operates i mean megan rapino is one of my heroes it's amazing that she took a knee it's amazing i think what she says in the book she's got very clear politics about issues like white allyship and the importance of of taking a step back and giving space to others to lead, but also to show solidarity and to share the weight, says all the right things. But the reality is also that in the five years since she took that knee, she's become an absolute icon. I mean, she's gone from Megan Rapino, small letters, to Megan Rapino, World Cup star, fashion icon, subway commercials. Now you compare and contrast that to someone like Colin Kaepernick. I mean, it's if Colin Kaepernick played soccer, they probably wouldn't have let him play in the World Cup, you know, let alone be a star in the World Cup. So I think, you know, that that needs to be looked at, I think, very, very carefully in terms of who, who gets lifted up through these protests and who gets torn down. Did you get in your DMs or were there people that didn't make the book that went, did you go international or did you try to keep this domestic? Yeah, I kept it domestic um, just because at the time, um, as I was putting it all together, I was so taken with what was happening around. I mean, after George Floyd is killed, you have demonstrations in all 50 states that had never happened in the history of the United States around one issue. So I, I really saw it in this U.S. format of like, how does this lead to this? Of course, after George Floyd was killed, there were demonstrations all over the world. So it wasn't just a U.S. issue, but I had sort of already uh, pigeonholed myself to making it a U.S. book and decided to roll with that. And I'm glad I did because I did an interview with the Irish Times for the book. And, you know, there's this now this uh, sort of tradition in English Premier League soccer where players take a knee before the game. 
And I sort of poo pooed all that and was sort of like, you know, that's, you know, management protests aren't really the same thing and take some of the bite out of it and all the rest of it. And he sort of gave me quite the talking to about racism among, you know, European soccer fans and how it's a direct challenge to that racism. And they're also anti-racist soccer fans who have their own clubs and it's showing solidarity with them. So instead of soccer being like this neutral force, which it always sort of has been, even though there's been racist skinheads in soccer for decades, now this is soccer taking a side and saying, we wanna be an anti-racist space. And that's an amazing thing. And it was something that I didn't, that I didn't consider, that I didn't take seriously. So if it had been part of the book, I probably would have screwed it up, but maybe the next one. Yeah, well, you know, you can say that soccer is, uh, is, is trying to do this, but then when you see what happens in uh, the Euro championship and how the four English soccer players yes. who are, are treated, you know, that puts everything back in perspective. So and that, 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 that moment, oh, sorry, that, that moment sure. too, reminded me so much of when the NBA players went on strike in August of 2020 after the police shooting of Jacob Blake, because they had all been taking a knee in the bubble and they started to feel like like a joke was how it was how they put it they started to feel like a joke like here we are taking a knee we're the nba against racism and nothing changes so they had to take it to that next level and similarly after that racism against players like marcus rashford who have been such amazing people not just players you, I was hearing that in their voices as well. Like, okay, just this taking a knee thing as part of this management approved activity is not really doing what we want it to do. And this is proof of that. Yeah. And I was going to ask, you know, um, about was it, was the gesture losing power because there's try people trying to co-opt it, right. And do exactly what you said. And then that made me think also about Jay-Z's comment that we've moved on from kneeling as he's sitting next to, you know, good um, right. So where do you think the, it is right now then in terms of that, do you think it, it is lost power? Do you think it, does that bother Kaepernick? Is it like, where do you put this then, you know, and then including things, comments made like Jay-Z, like, and, and things of this nature? First of all, there's never been a more awkward high five in the history of high fives than Roger Goodell and Jay-Z. So anytime you produce a high five that awkward, nothing good can come out of that. And that, that should have been the sign before he even said, you know, we don't, you know, we're beyond kneeling or what have you. Um, what, what I have found in terms of taking a knee is that uh, timing is everything and location is everything. So yeah, taking a knee in my opinion has lost its bite um, when it's done you know, without risk because I wish this wasn't the case, Ben, but it's the risk that gives it its power. You know, the fact that people see you do it and they know you're taking a chance uh, because you realize that this matters. What you're dealing with matters more um than just going along to get along so i, I think like I, I still get emails since the books come out I, I still get emails of like hey my high school just took a knee because there was a racist snapchat going around the school and things like that and i think when students are doing that i think it still has bite you know if they're willing to put themselves out there to as a as a symbol against racism and i think it also has power when it comes through the sports world when it comes through the athletic department because you know when i was growing up that wasn't exactly the place you looked to for politics if anything it was the negation of politics was the sports team or reactionary politics coming from the sports teams and the coaches and to see that shift is really remarkable and i think it's shift irrevocably so i think taking a knee still matters in a huge way I just think we always have to look at who's doing it and why and what for, because, you know, seeing police in Schenectady do it, you know, that's just not the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I said before we got on air here that it was, um, you know, symbolic, ironic that we were going to be talking about this when yesterday watching the NFL, there was nothing but 
camouflage sweatshirts and hoodies and hats and you have the usual flyovers and the can we get an American flag bigger this week than last week and um, yeah. and it, no we got Veterans Day coming up and so this can you just talk that juxtaposition about what you're writing about and, and what Kaepernick did with this militarization of of the NFL and sports yeah I mean this militarization start after the, the militarization start mostly after 9-11 and then you know explain how that partnership yeah I mean I gotta say after 9-11 it, it, it goes up to 11 on a scale of 1 to 10 before 9-11 it exists there's always been militarization as a part of the of, of football uh it's always been a part of it the game has always had military trappings. I mean, quarterbacks are called field generals and they throw bullets and bombs as they march down the field. There's always been this martial language. Uh, a football player named Dave Megacy uh, quit the NFL in 1969 precisely because he felt like the sport itself was building support for the Vietnam War. And Richard Nixon, of course, was, was a huge football fan. Um, and he even called certain uh military procedures in vietnam things like operation quarterback and so that just disgusted dave Megacy to no end so that's always been a part of football but it was only after 9 11 that the nfl enters into this formal partnership with the pentagon where they do these uh salute to the troops type events at the games and those happen every week and you know the, the pentagon actually subsidizing the NFL doing this when there are homeless vets like that alone is kind of gross but just the ways in which the NFL tries to be this ex like they say oh we're not political but this is explicit politics of militarism and nationalism which the NFL just bathes itself in um this I think was challenged by Colin Kaepernick when he took a knee during that at the anthem um, because no, he wasn't, even though his detractors said what he was doing was anti-military. And yes, it's true. It had nothing to do with the military, what he was doing. It was about police violence and racial inequity. Still, by taking a knee during the anthem, given how hyper-militarized the NFL has been since 9-11, it was this kind of implicit challenge to the political priorities of the league. And if you have these challenges, it doesn't only challenge the whole salute to service. The only politics that count are the politics of franchise owners. It doesn't only challenge that. It challenges the very racialized labor discipline that the NFL depends on to survive. Because I'll just, if I can say, they need labor discipline in the NFL and it's racialized. They need racial labor discipline. When you have a league that's 70% black, and there are no black owners and there are three black head coaches and uh, a paucity of black, very few black executives. What you need is to make sure the players don't take a step back and say, wait a minute, this is, this is BS. Or why do we have unguaranteed contracts? You know, why don't we, why can't we get healthcare for life? You know, wh why is being a black player in the NFL, like Martellus Bennett likes to say, why does NFL stand for not for long? Or as uh, or they, they said other stuff too about what NFL stands for. Um, but wh why is it like that? And when Colin Kaepernick takes a knee, what it does, is it's like, it's like you're playing Jenga and he pulls out like a little piece at the bottom and the whole thing teeters. It might just look like a little piece, but that piece is essential to the whole construct. And can you explain to, to uh, our students who don't know who Nate Boyer was or is? Absolutely. Yeah, Nate Boyer is a former uh, Green Beret and NFL player um, who Colin Kaepernick met with very early on in the process. Like when Colin Kaepernick first sat during the anthem, he was sitting, not kneeling. And that caused a firestorm in and of itself that he sat. And all these people, particularly people around Donald Trump, we're saying that it was anti-military and that he should leave the country, all kinds of things like that. Uh, Colin Kaepernick said, I need to do something about this. So he met with Nate Boyer because he was a former Green Beret and said, what, what can I do? And they together came up with this idea that if Colin Kaepernick only kneeled during the anthem, it would show deference and respect to the process 
of the national anthem while also registering his dissent. And he should kneel in front of his teammates proudly, not behind his teammates. As Nate Boyer liked to say, he said, you kneel when you pray, you kneel when you propose. It's a gesture of, of, of respect and seriousness. And in sports as well, if anyone who's played sports knows that when the coach says, okay, everybody take a knee, that means you're coming in to talk seriously. And it's a serious talk. It's an intimate statement. Let's come in and take a knee. And of course, they were wrong. <laughs> they thought it would calm everything down when he started taking a knee. Instead, it just blew everything up through the stratosphere. And I think they all learned. Nate Boyer learned it, definitely. Colin Kaepernick learned it, that if people don't want to hear your message, they're not going to care what the messenger really does or dresses it up or puts it in a top hat, hands it a cane, whatever. It's like, if people don't want to hear the message, they will come down on you. And I think that that, that was a, a tough lesson that, that, that they had to learn and that all of us learned in real time. And there's something about the power of taking a knee, thanks to not just Kaepernick, but the effect and all the people doing it, which is really like nothing else. Um, if we were at the state fair in Maryland and we took a knee during the national anthem, there would be no mistake whatsoever what we were doing. None whatsoever. Everyone would know we were doing this because we were against police brutality and racial inequity. There's a universalized aspect to it that's very strong. I saw someone do it at the Wizards game a couple of weeks ago. They took a knee while the anthem was playing. And you should have seen the way nobody talked. I was, I'm very happy to say, go Wizards, that nobody talked smack to this person or poured a beer on their head or anything like that. After all, it wasn't an NFL game. Uh, but what they did do was there was like this weird vibe and force field around him where everybody was just looking and being like, oh my gosh, is this really happening? And so then I did it too. So he'd be less alone in the process. Normally that's when I go, uh, you know, use the facilities or, or get a Coca-Cola or something. But in this case, it was like, all right, I gotta, I gotta kneel because this guy's kneeling. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I think there's a power to it that exists to this day no matter how much they try to hijack it. I mean, I got a gazillion more questions, but we only got an hour. We only got about seven minutes left. I want to get make sure anybody else got some questions in. So, so uh, I do want to, as briefly as you can, since we're, we're DMV, explain to these students why the history, as briefly as you can, of hail, hail to the, and why that team is historically so racist and why there's so many Dallas fans in this area. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, there are Dallas fans in this area because the DC team was the last team to integrate uh, because the, and they only did because the Kennedy administration in the early 60s threatened to take the land that RFK Stadium was eventually built upon because it was federal land. And the uh, franchise owner was a guy named George Preston Marshall, who was openly racist. I mean, it wasn't just that he didn't want any black players on the team. Uh, he also uh, had it in his will that none of the money that, that, that went through his charity and foundation could go to any causes that believed in integration. I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a, a racist um, and, and not apologetic about it. Um, and it shouldn't surprise us that somebody with that outlook, those politics, would find the Washington name, the R word as we call it, uh, very appropriate for his team. But but there, there's this history of, of Black DC supporting the Dallas Cowboys precisely because the Cowboys had Black players and the Washington football team not only didn't, but were helmed by, by an open racist. Um, that's the short version of the story. There, there are certainly longer versions and folks should read about it uh, with more detail. But what it comes down to is that the name was a racial slur. Oh, one la other fast aspect of the story that's important is that at the time there were no teams in Florida, there were no teams in, in you know, Carolina. So Washington was the southernmost team in the NFL. And so it was having all white players calling yourselves the R word. It was very openly about appealing to the entire Southeast of the United States and using racism to do it. All right, let's see. Any questions, anybody? Either raise your hand or type in the chat in our last closing minutes here. Any questions at all? You know, I'm a Ravens fan, so. Uh, you are. 
Yeah. Uh, John, go ahead. Yes. Um, thank you so much, David, for coming and speaking to us. That was very uh, presentable and I, I'm, I'm excited to read your book. Awesome. Um, so one of the things, one of the questions I want to ask is this, this kneeling effect and like how you see my generation, younger kids, high school, college, and at sporting events, most specifically, because that's where it seems like all the attention is, is towards with sporting events. You see people kneel for a national anthem. Um, and when I see that, I say, yes, I'm like happy that for that, because I understand that they, they not only just police brutality in general, but maybe amongst other issues as well. Like, and I think you even mentioned like how I, this country doesn't have a good healthcare system. This country is not focusing on climate change. That's going to affect all of our gen future generations to come. So they, it may not just be police brutality, but it may be other issues as well that they're kneeling and that our government or people, people in power, they're not focusing on. But one of the things that um, I get confused, like, it, I just like, I'm like, why aren't they, like, I just get confused about is like, yes, you can kneel for the anthem, but why aren't they doing, why don't people who do kneel for the anthem do more for, for a say? Like, why don't, why aren't they calling people to say, hey, vote, vote, vote this act in so we can get this done or, call, pro, or protesting more or calling their politicians more, like just doing more than just kneeling for the anthem. Yes, because I do believe that kneeling for the anthem can, can, um, get people's attention. I just don't feel like it's enough or it's not, it's not, it's just not like, I feel like it can sometimes just be like a trend, like a trend that's saying, Hey, since he's doing it, I can, do, I'm doing it. And then that's going to be, then it's like, that's the end of the day. But I feel like you need, because like, I feel like if people knew for the anthem, they should be doing just more than just new for the anthem, even something as small as going to the soup kitchen nearby and serving and giving out food to homeless people, like something that's productive in life that's going to help people. I feel like just kneeling for an anthem just may be like, it's, it's something good. Like I support it. I, I, that's what makes, that's what we're allowed to do in this country because we have freedom of speech. We're allowed to kneel for the anthem. We don't have to stand for a song or a, or a flag, but we, but I feel like there can be done more. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, my thoughts, a great question. My thoughts is that for a lot of people taking that knee during the anthem is like the first step. And anytime I see somebody taking a first step towards activism, I want to be as supportive as possible. So the, the response to me should never be, well, you're doing that, but why don't you do more? I think the response should be more like, yes, you did that. Now let's see what we can get out of that. Can we start a community forum out of that where you can explain what you did? Can we use that forum as a way to speak about the very issues that you're talking about, Sean? Because to me, the answer doesn't lie in individuals and in individual actions. Uh, the answer lies in collective actions. And the thing about taking a knee is that it can inspire large groups of people to be active and, and to be unified. Um, and these kinds of symbolic actions can have like a great deal of power into spurring other people to act. And so if someone asked me, said to me, let's hype, pretend I'm like 17, said, sure, you took a knee, but what are you doing? I would respond, I took a knee. That's what I'm doing. And now I'm dealing with a ton of crap from my coach, ton of crap from my teammates, dealing with stuff from my teachers, my family. But I also have people coming up to me every day and saying, good looking out. I'm glad you're with us. I'm glad you're on the side. You opened a lot of eyes. I mean, we need more of that in this country. So I'm for, I'm for more demonstrations. I'm for more people doing that. And, you know, and, and if we want to ask the question, well, what are you doing? What's coming out of it? That's a very fair question, but the answer should be, we look in the mirror and then say, okay, I agree with that they took a knee. What am I now doing to push the struggle forward? So that's how I would answer that. I would just be like very, very charitable to the folks who did it. And, um, and, not, and this is why it's so important when I mentioned about more of a mentioned Trevon Martin than mentioned Colin Kaepernick. That to me was such a key point because it shows that they weren't just following a trend but that they were acting out of something in their hearts. I want to be respectful for, for our speaker's time, so we're going to have to end it there. However, oh. uh, David will tell you, it's pretty easily accessible. You can find him on Twitter. If you DM him, he'll answer you back. You tweet at him, he'll answer you back. Um, you know, he answers emails. So if you have other questions, you can give them to me, and, and I can pass them along as well. Again, if you're on this, you're going to get a copy of the book uh, as well. So make sure I have your, your email addresses for your, your mailing addresses for that. So... Dave, I just want to thank you. I know it's late over there in Barcelona, um, but I just want to thank you for taking the time to, to meet with our students, um, to give us this hour. The book is fantastic. Um, I'm so thankful that you wrote it, and I'm so thankful oh. that all our students are going to get it as well. 
Well, let me say something like, I mean, ha having taught there, uh, my class there for a couple of years and having that for me largely derailed by family stuff in the pandemic more than anything else, I really did love teaching there. And I felt like the students at MC were absolutely as as smart and as and as able and as sharp as colleges. I mean, I've lectured at Ivy League schools, I've lectured at UMD, whatever. It's like there, there's been no better educational atmosphere for me than the classroom at, U, at, at MC. Thank you, Dave. And uh, when we get back face to face, we'll uh, we'll bring you in since you're right down the street, and uh, and, and we'll we'll await for your next project. So thank you.